tool for digesting time series predictability is the vector autoregression. Why? If you looked at some of the previous formulas, we had things like regressions of long horizon future returns, even infinite horizon future returns on dividend yields. Well, where do I get data on the infinite horizon? You saw that I truncated it at 15 years, but still, 15 years of future returns on dividend yields, that, that looks hard to do. The natural thing to do when you have uh, long horizon forecasts you want to do is to use short horizon forecasts and find their implied long horizon, uh, the long horizon implications. And that's what the vector autoregression does. Now, this is dangerous. <laughs> uh, using short run trends and extrapolating them to long run things has, has led many people into error. Uh, these ones are the subject of a huge literature where we've decided that it's OK. And the key to OK is that the dividend yield on the right hand side is a co-integrating vector. That tends to be where short, long horizon implications of short run dynamics work OK and, and keep you out of many dangers. So what's the idea? Uh, the basic vector autoregression is we will run return, dividend growth, and dividend yields on one lag of the dividend yield. And then, then we can iterate things forward to figure out long horizons. In, in general, you add more lags of things, other variables, and so forth. Uh, this also comes from a digestion that, that more lags of these variables, at least, don't, don't change the basic picture. I'm going to show you that much. Other variables change the picture a lot, but we'll start with what we can tell uh, with dividend yields. So uh, basic numbers to keep in your head. Uh, when you run these, pretty much the return coefficient's about 0.1. The dividend growth coefficient's about 0. Dividend yields are very persistent, 0.94. They, they take a long time. Uh, some sense of the variances here um, of returns, dividend yield, and, and dividend growth. And in a very important feature, it turns out in the data, you know, features of the data that are important, uh, that dividend growth shocks and dividend yield shocks turn out to be roughly uncorrelated. That drives a lot of the properties of what we'll see, as well as these coefficients. That drives a lot of the properties of what we'll see as well. So let's look at our, our, our simple VAR. Uh, here it is. Um, uh, again, the simple VAR, and I repeated the numbers for your memory, roughly 0 0.10 and 0 0.94, with a covariance between those two shocks of about 0. Now, once again, our, our identities tell us a lot about these, these three things, and particularly the return identity. Return is related to dividend growth, dividend yield, and dividend price ratio. It tells you we, we really only have two separate variables and two separate shocks. Once I tell you any two of return, dividend growth, and dividend price ratio, I can tell you what the third one is uh, from that equation. Uh, so these things are all going to be linked in that way by the identity. Uh, the easiest one uh, you can see is let's now take that return identity, apply it to these three regressions, as we've been applying identities to regression coefficients all, all, to, all in all, run regressions of left-hand side and right-hand side on today's dividend yield. That's BR, uh, that's minus rho phi, uh, that's BD, and that's 1. So what we find is that uh, just from the identity, these regression coefficients, since there, there's only two real variables, there's only two separate regression coefficients. And BR is 1 minus rho phi plus uh, BD. They're linked mechanically that way. That's true in the numbers that we see roughly. Uh, 0.1 is about 1 minus 0 0.96 times 0.94 plus 0. So the numbers I quoted you obey that regression coefficient. Uh, similarly, the errors. Um, uh, have to obey the, the this identity means that the shock to returns equals minus rho times the shock to dividend yields plus the shock to dividend growth rates. Uh, those three things are mechanically linked. And that's it looks like mysterious equations, but it's just telling you something blindingly obvious. In order for you to get a return, either prices have to go up or dividends have to go up. If, if neither prices or dividend move, you don't get any return. Those things are, are mechanically linked together. And it, it already has an implication. Uh, now, the fact is, the fact in the data that we saw is that uh, these two shocks, the dividend growth and dividend yield shocks, are roughly uncorrelated with each other. That tells us uh, uh, the rest of the correlation structure follows from that fact. The most important one is that dividend yield shocks are negatively correlated with return shocks, and uh, dividend growth shocks are going to be positively correlated uh, with return shocks. So those facts that I showed you before of the correlation structure of uh, the returns, those all follow from the identity. The important one is that that one is zero, and then the fact that those are, are positive and negative big 
follows from the return identities. So what do we have? We have a, a simple vector autoregression and some identities uh, that just stem from the fact that we only really have two variables. We can use that now to answer some of the, the most important questions um, in, and to understand where some of the facts we've seen have come from. The first fact I, I want to show you is uh, uh, connecting long and short horizons. It looked like in our tables, like and originally in the literature, the short horizons look kind of boring. We look to long horizons and wow, look at those big R squareds. So long horizon predictability seemed like it was some separate new phenomenon. Uh, but it's not when, uh, when you look at, uh, at the equations of the simple vector autoregression. What the vector autoregression shows us is that long horizon predictability is exactly the same thing as short horizon predictability when the forecasting variable moves slowly over time. So the equations let us do that. Uh, there again, is, this is the relevant part of the VAR. We just need those two equations, returns and dividend yields. So let's look at a long run return forecast, the forecast of two year returns. Well, that's the, the first one, BRDP, but then the second one is RT plus two, the second year return, that's going to be uh, one BR times phi DP, next year's dividend yield plus an error. And similarly, the three year return is BR one plus phi plus phi squared. You can see what's happening right here. The coefficients are rising with horizon because the forecasting variable is very persistent. When phi is a big number, the coefficients rise with horizon. Similarly, the R squareds. We saw that, that beautiful R squared rising with horizon. Well, let's just work it out. Uh, work it out in the vector autoregression. The R squared at a one period horizon is um, the, that's the, ver the R squared is the variance of the right hand variable divided by the variance of the left hand variable. So this is the variance of the right hand variable. That's the variance of the left hand variable. So that's the R squared at one period horizon. The R squared at two period horizon, well, that now is the right hand variable. So the variance of the right hand variable is B squared one plus phi squared variance of dividend yields. The variance of the left-hand variable is the variance of the sum of returns, which is approximately twice the variance of the returns. So you can see what's happening. The R squared is very the R squared is going up. One plus phi squared, if phi were one, that would be twice the R squared of the one period horizon. It's rising a little bit less than linearly. So both coefficients and R squareds rise with horizon, not because of anything magic about long horizons, simply because the forecasting variable itself is very serially correlated. And, and here's a picture version of that, that intuition. Here's a slow moving forecasting variable. The slow moving forecasting variable forecasts long horizon returns. Why? Because if it's high today and they're forecasting a high return for tomorrow, if it's high today, it's going to be high again tomorrow and therefore forecast a return for the day after tomorrow. So all the little returns uh, add up. Uh, it's as if it's the same way that January in Chicago forecasts a small temperature rise every day, and the R squared says it'll be hot in six months. Sit down and don't worry about it. So the long and short horizon things are, are, are purely related by the persistence of the forecasting variable. They're not separate horizons. That's one of the nice things that we can see uh, right away by using this vector autoregression. regression.